Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Though Though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all of you that give me, and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bree. Uh, When I was younger, maybe about 10 or 11, I went round to my friend Robbie's house uh, and Robbie had a new tennis racket and he was showing me his serve uh, in the living room and Robbie's parents, they had a lovely uh, house and a lovely glass lampshade, I guess, not quite a chandelier, but certainly uh, very fragile, very ornate, uh, very expensive. And Robbie, Robbie was quite a tall lad for his age, and he took a particularly big swing with the tennis racket. And with an almighty crash, he smashed the glass lampshade, tiny shards of glass all over the living room. Robbie's mum came downstairs pretty quickly. Um, I made myself scarce pretty quickly too. I went home, I didn't want to be around in the aftermath. Things did tend to get broken when Robbie was around, actually a glass window in the shed of our garden was struck by one of his wayward crosses with a football, and this time it was my mum who appeared with a face like thunder. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that as a child, an awful moment, isn't it? A feeling of horror, the colour drains from your face as you've been caught red-handed having done something catastrophic. Uh, when you're caught in the midst of a situation that is entirely your fault and there's no way out, there's no excuse. What is going to happen next? Kids break things though, don't they? It's just stuff after all. But what about something really important? Have you ever been exposed like that, having done something really bad, maybe a mistake or an oversight at work that has proved really costly, caught in a lie perhaps, caught stealing, caught doing something you shouldn't have been doing. Do you remember that feeling of exposure, having done something wrong or wronged somebody else? Comes with a jolt, doesn't it, in the pit of your stomach and a fear, how is this person going to react? Well, we join the story in Genesis at a low moment for Jacob. His trickery and his deception have meant that he is on the run for his life. He is the child of the promise. He is the one on whom God's promises for the world rest. He is the one through whom the nations will be blessed, but through his own sin, he has endangered everything. He's on the run, his brother is after him, 
He must be feeling pretty sorry for himself. His reckless gamble has risked everything. How will God respond to him? When we sin, when we are caught out, when we have a recognition of our guilt before God, when we know we've got no excuse and we come before him, how does he respond to us? Well, this week we've got a wonderful picture of the Lord's amazing transformative grace. His grace is his undeserved favor that he shows Jacob. He offers him protection, provision, blessing, even as he appears to Jacob at this low moment, this moment of shame. And it's transformative. This is the beginning of Jacob's transformation, a turning point in his faith journey. Jacob is the trickster, the deceiver, who learns to trust. So right at the end of Jacob's life, uh, later on at the end of Genesis, he says, may the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, who has delivered me from all harm. That's where Jacob's faith journey leads. He recognizes at the end of his life that his days that he describes as being few and difficult, God has been his shepherd all the way through. He comes to recognize that, that he's been protected, and cared for. That's where his faith journey ends. This week is the turning point for him when he begins to learn that lesson. Jacob is the trickster, the deceiver, who learns to trust. So we have two points today. Firstly, the Lord graciously promises to bless Jacob. Let me read again from verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran, When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you, until I have done what I have promised you. So Jacob is on his way to Haran, on the run for his life, remember, and this is the moment that the Lord chooses to appear to him. This is Jacob's first direct encounter with the Lord. But what does God say to him? What words of comfort does God have? Verse 13, the Lord says, I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. Easy perhaps to skip over those words, but they are loaded words, pregnant with meaning, not just any old introduction. God is saying, I am the same God that your father Abraham knew, the sovereign creator of everything, the God of the whole earth, the God that your father Abraham knew as a God who made promises, the God who made promises to bring blessing back to the world, the God who has not abandoned this world to death and decay, but will bless the world, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, Isaac the miracle baby. Abraham was promised many descendants, as many as there are grains of sand at the beach, but uh, but Abraham had none. To his barren wife, Sarah, Isaac was born, the child of the promise. God is saying, I'm that God, the same God, the God of your grandfather Abraham, your father Isaac, and now I am your God too. Second half of verse 13, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, 
and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. These are the promises that were made to Abraham, that were passed on to Isaac, and last week they were passed on to Jacob, and now they are being reaffirmed by God. Even though Jacob has thrown the whole project into jeopardy, the project was to bless the world through this family, and Jacob has caused a war within the family. How can they become a great nation and be a blessing to the world when one brother wants to kill the other? How can they be a blessing to the world when they appear cursed? Nonetheless, at this low moment, when the promises seem miles away and Jacob is largely to blame, God reaffirms his promise. He will be faithful. He will keep it. And he ties himself to the promise. Did you notice he goes even further in verse 15? He says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. He adds this promise, this oath. He declares, I am with you. I will watch over you. As I said earlier, Jacob, at the end of his life, he will recognize that God kept this promise. Jacob is about to end up a long way from home, and this promise won't come quickly, but God will be with him throughout, watching over him. God will be with Jacob. This is really significant. Jacob's father, Isaac, when he was involved in a squabble with the men of the land, uh, the men of the land came to recognize that God was with Isaac. They say, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. They learn the name of the Lord because they see that the Lord has been faithful to Isaac. The same will be true for Jacob. God will be with him, will protect him and provide for him, even when he is far from home. So here we've got, on the one hand, an assurance about the big picture. Despite human sin, God's plans will stay on track. But it's also very personal. God says to Jacob, who will become the father of the nation of Israel, I will be with you. I will be your shepherd. Jesus says to his disciples, I will be with you till the end of the age as you go and make disciples of all nations. The same is true for us. Jesus says to his disciples, he won't leave them as orphans, but will be with them by his spirits. The same is true for us. God will be with us. He won't leave us until he has accomplished what he promised. He will be with us when the promises seem far away. He will be with us when we mess up, as he promised to be with Jacob. He does not abandon us. This is such a precious truth to grasp. The Psalms often reflect on it. Psalm 121 is a short psalm, a great psalm to learn off by heart, actually. I'll read it out for us. And notice the language of watching over. This psalm is reflecting on the truth in this story. Let me read it to you. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. So that's what the Lord says to Jacob. I am the Lord, the same God your fathers knew. I am your God. I'll keep the promises. They are yours now. And I will be with you and watch over you. That's what Jacob hears when the Lord appears to him. But what does Jacob see? Verse 12. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. What is going on here? Why does Jacob see a ladder? I confess to having struggled with this a little bit. 
But listen to this from Genesis 11. In fact, why don't we turn there? Keep a finger in Genesis 28 and just flick back to Genesis 11 on page 12. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. This is what the people say in Genesis 11. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Some similarities here, aren't there? The tower that humanity wants to build, it reaches the heavens. There's also mention of people scattering and being spread across the earth. Though the people building the tower, they don't want to be scattered. They don't want to fulfill God's purpose for them. Jacob's descendants will be spread across the whole earth in line with God's purpose. But there's a big difference, isn't there? The people build the Tower of Babel out of pride. They want to ascend. They want to go up to God to shake their fist at him and reject his purpose for them. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to be great. They want to exalt themselves. However, the ladder in chapter 28, well, the Lord stands at the top. He declares his name. He he declares what he will do. He declares how he will bring blessing to the world. The initiative is all God's. He is the one acting. Although he doesn't descend the ladder, his angels do. He bridges the gap between heaven and earth. He makes that step. It's his initiative. He brings heaven and earth back together. The plans of humanity at Babel are thwarted. Their language is confused. They're scattered. But at the ladder, God declares that his purposes will prevail despite the mess that Jacob is in. You might recall in John's Gospel, when Jesus meets Nathanael, one of his disciples, Jesus says this, You will see greater things than this. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He refers to this vision. He says to Nathanael, You will see what Jacob saw, heaven thrown open. But Jesus puts himself at the center of the vision. The angels don't descend on the ladder, they descend on him. He is the ladder between heaven and earth. Through the Lord Jesus, God will bring blessing back to the world. So we've seen God's amazing grace promising to bless Jacob. Second point, Jacob's transformation. Back in Genesis 28 now. And I'll read again from verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So God is, uh, Jacob is transformed by his experience of the grace of God. He's understandably overawed by what he has seen. This is his first encounter with the Lord. Sometimes we think when we read the Old Testament that this sort of thing happened all the time. Uh, But in reality, this is an extraordinary moment. Uh, God spoke to Abraham a handful of times over his long, long life, often with many years in between. Isaac, I believe we get one line of the Lord speaking directly to Isaac. But neither Abraham nor Isaac saw a vision like this. Surely it's no accident, though. It's kind of the Lord to give Jacob this vision, this great assurance at his low moment. And it has an effect on him. Look at what he does in verse 18. He sets up a pillar 
and pours oil on top of it, and he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. He marks the place. He sets up a pillar in an act of worship to the Lord. He recognizes that the Lord has made himself especially present, and he responds with worship. And he renames the place. Now, this is where Hebrew is uh, really interesting. There aren't that many words in Hebrew, and they all sound quite similar. I say this as somebody who hasn't been learning very long. Uh, But it's not like English, uh, where if we uh, name things, um, the meaning of the name is not normally on the surface. So if I were to say to you, my name's Jonathan, uh, well, I'd be lying because my name's Chris, but if I were to say to you, my name's Jonathan, um, I'd have to explain what it means because the meaning is not there on the surface. But in Hebrew, the meaning is plain on the surface. So, for example, Bethlehem, uh, Beit Lechem, means house of bread. Jesus was born in the house of bread, maybe a gingerbread house, I don't know. But Luz, the place where Jacob has his dream, well, it means almond tree. Presumably there was an almond tree nearby. But Luz also means crooked or devious. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? given what we know about Jacob. He is the deceiver. He just deceived his brother. I'm not sure why it it means almond tree and crooked. Maybe the branches of the almond tree are particularly crooked. I don't know. So we have Jacob the deceiver. He comes to sit down and rest in the place of deception. Jacob the crook sits down and rests under the crooked branches of the crooked tree. And this is where the Lord appears to him. And after this encounter, he renames the place Bethel, Beit El, the house of God. Finally, Jacob makes a vow, verse 20. If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey and give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. His vow is a commitment in response to God's promise to me. He picks up on those words, watch over me. He says, the Lord will be my God. The Lord introduced himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, which begs the question, will he be Jacob's God as well? And at this turning point in Jacob's life, the answer is yes. If the Lord watches over me, then he shall be my God. This is the change that is brought about by an encounter with God's grace. Jacob the deceiver, Jacob the crook, becomes Jacob the believer, Jacob who worships the Lord. So as we close, be be encouraged. However far away the promises of God feel, he will keep them. He has, in the Lord Jesus, come to save his people and bring blessing to the world. In Jesus, these promises are fulfilled, so we can trust that he will come again. Be encouraged personally if you feel uh, burdened by sin or discouraged, perhaps that feeling of being exposed, that you've messed up big time. Well, see how God deals with Jacob here and be encouraged See that here, as across the rest of the Bible, there is always more grace. God's plans for the world won't be thwarted by human pride, and his plans for us won't be thwarted by our own sin. God will still work in us and through us as his people to bring his name glory and to bring blessing to the world. Be encouraged that, in fact, it is at the lowest moment of Jacob's life that he receives this word from God. Isn't that so often the case uh, in our lives and in the testimony of others, that through the hardship and suffering, those are the times when God's provision feels very precious and we learn to trust him. Be encouraged that God's grace really does transform. It transformed Jacob. It can transform us. It can transform others we know. Jacob the crook doesn't seem like the best candidate to bring blessing back to the world, does he? Of course, that's precisely the point. It's not anything in him that makes him worthy. 
It's all God's grace. So be encouraged. God has not abandoned his promises. He has not abandoned his people. He hasn't abandoned you. Let's pray as we close. Thank you, Father, for your grace, for these amazing promises that you reaffirm down through the generations despite the sin of your people. And thank you that this grace transforms. Thank you that it transforms Jacob the crook. Thank you that it transforms us as well. Please would we be those who are increasingly transformed by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.